So you want to log something in a Spring Boot application. How do you do logging in Spring Boot? No, 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 not that. Definitely not that. How do you do proper logging in a Spring Boot application? And what are your options? Well, let me show you. Well, I hope that I don't have to tell you why system.out.println is a bad idea and we need a proper logging framework. A logging framework gives us the benefit of allowing you to configure its behavior rather than just do things one way. For example, you can decide where the messages go. You can set things like logging levels and uh, you can choose if you want to put it to a file, you want to send it as an email, you want to save it to database, whatever else. So. Yeah, for your Spring Boot applications, at least for production applications, you need proper logging. Okay, well, how do you get started? Thankfully, Spring Boot is a type of framework that follows the everything included philosophy. So it does come with its own logging framework included. And as with other things in Spring Boot, it is opinionated. It has some default settings and configurations for logging that you can just use out of the box. The basic act of logging something in a Spring Boot application couldn't be more simpler than they've made it. Let me show you. So here is a Spring Boot app from the Spring Starter site that I've created, start.spring.io. I have created this with just one dependency, the Spring Boot Starter web dependency. Click this card if you want to know how to create a new Spring Boot application, a Spring Boot project. All right, so I've got this project and I've opened it in an IDE. Let me open the pom.xml here. So here you can see that there is this one dependency that Spring has created for me. It's the Spring Boot Starter Web Dependency. It's nothing fancy really, it's just a web dependency that allows this project, this application, to act as a web app. Remember this dependency, okay? We'll come back to that in just a minute. All right, so now I want to demonstrate some logging and I need a place to add log messages. So I'm gonna create the simple REST controller and uh, I'm gonna request map it to the root URL and I'm going to return a string here which just lets us know that this controller was called when we access that URL. Uh, and of course, I need to add an annotation here to make this a REST controller. And now we have a simple REST controller. I can start the app and I can access this in, um, in a browser. All right, so I'm going to start this as a Java class. And I open the browser, access localhost 8080. I get that message. Simple. All right, now on to adding logging to this controller. How do I add logging? The basic way to add logging is to use this class called logger factory, and it has a method called get logger. All right, so it's a static method which takes in your class so that it knows which class is doing the actual logging, and then you get a logger object out of it. All right, so I'm gonna call this logger factory .get logger in order to get this logger object. This logger factory .get logger is a standard way for you to log in Java using this framework called SLF4J, right? It's almost like a de facto standard for logging in Java. So it works pretty much the same way. You use SLF4J because it's available to you. And then you use this logger object to just log something. I'm gonna log uh, I'm going to do a logger.error here, and then I'm going to pass in a string. Error happened. Of course, no error has happened here. I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes. All right, so I'm going to save, restart this project, and then um, open this in the browser. And if I look at the console here, you see here, error happened. And every time I access this controller method, a message gets logged. All right, so this is how you log. Simple, default, out of the box behavior for logging. Now you might be wondering, what's doing the actual logging? Uh, if you know SLF4J is pretty much like an interface and it doesn't do the actual logging, you need a logging library for logging those messages. So what's happening here? So what happens is 
again, like I said, Spring Boot has intelligent defaults. It has this kind of out of the box behavior for logging because it kind of assumes that, well, everybody needs logging, so I might as well provide it. So when I added this dependency, Spring Boot Starter Web, what it does is it also pulls in this dependency called Spring Boot Starter Logging. I'm pretty sure all of these starter dependencies have an implicit dependency on starter logging. So no matter which one you choose, you are kind of getting logging out of the box. And what happens when starter logging is added? Well, what it's doing is it's actually having a dependency on this other thing called Spring JCL. This stands for Spring Commons Logging Bridge, all right? So this is these are the two dependencies which are actually causing logging functionality to be available to your project. All right, so that's the first thing. Well, then what is actually doing all the work for you? What is actually logging it? Like I mentioned, SLF4J is just the interface. What's the actual implementation? Well, it turns out the default implementation in Spring Boot, when you use this kind of starter dependency, is a little framework called Logback. Logback is a framework which is kind of a successor to the Log4J framework, which is kind of pretty popular. It used to be the most widely used uh, logging framework was Log4J, but now it's been discontinued from active development and Logback is kind of like a successor. So if you go to logback.qos.ch, which is the homepage for this Logback project, you can learn a little bit more about it, all right? And we can actually verify that your Spring Boot project uses Logback. Let me show you. So if you switch back to your ID, and if you look at the external libraries folder, you can see here are the logback jars. So this is what is actually doing the implementation. You are calling the logging API using SLF4J, but then SLF4J is delegating the logging work itself to logback, which happens to be there in your class path because you used the starter web dependency. All right. Now, let's look at how to configure log levels. In the home method, we did a logger.error, but it's not quite an error, is it? We wanna trace, we wanna have some message which says, hey, we reached the controller, we executed the controller, but it's not quite an error level. So let's change that. So what I'm gonna do is set this to trace. All right, I'm gonna have a trace message here. It says, uh, home method accessed. All right, by default, if I were to restart this application and run it, this message is not gonna show in the console because the default log level in your Spring Boot application is info and trace is not up to the info level. It is, It does not get logged. It's. It has to be info or above, all right? So how do you make trace show? Well, the answer is you define a property in your property file. I can add a property in my application.properties to tell this logging infrastructure to log trace messages as well. And here's how you do it. I'm gonna open the application.properties file. And then here I'm gonna add a property logging.level.root equals trace. Now what this is gonna do is it's gonna set the logging level for the root of your Spring Boot project, which means it's gonna set it to everything. And all of the logging levels for the whole project is gonna be set to trace. All right, now let's restart and see what happens. I'm restarting my application. And uh, look at this craziness here. Look at the amount of log messages that's being rendered each time. All right, this is happening because we have set the entire application's log level to trace, which means that even the spring logging, even the spring boot and the spring frameworks logging at trace level is being logged here. So, okay, we clearly need to be able to set different log levels for the framework and the library code as opposed to our application code, right? So thankfully, you can specify a package name when setting log levels. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to create this, I'm gonna set this property as, uh, let's say I make it info, which is the default, and then I'm going to do logging.level dot, and my package name, which is io.javabrains, and I'm gonna set this to trace, all right? Now, if I were to restart this, only the io.javabrains package will have trace level of logging, and then the other packages will have the default level of logging, all right? Now, here you can see the trace method uh, is being called, and it's being logged, but 
none of the other craziness is happening. All right, now here is a slide which talks about some of the other properties that you can set in application.properties. All right, so you have a bunch of stuff like logging.file, which lets you define the log file, and then you can specify some of the properties of log file, like max size, max history, the path of the log file, and then you can also have what the pattern of your log messages are gonna be, all right? So you have a bunch of these as well. All right, now let's look at one more thing that you can do to make this a little bit better, uh, one thing that you will notice is as you make more and more configuration for your log properties, all those property keys are gonna mess up your uh, application or properties file. There's gonna be a lot of confusion, a lot of configuration in your property file. And uh, let's say you wanna extract that out and you wanna have XML configuration. There is a standard XML way of configuring frameworks like Logpack, and let's say you wanna do that. Well, you can do this by specifying a certain file name .xml in the class path. So there are a couple of file names that Spring looks at. So you have logback.xml, which is kind of like the standard way in which you configure the logback logging framework, or you can say logback-spring.xml, all right? And this is what Spring Boot looks at. As long as you add one of these files to the class path, with this particular name, you can specify your logging configuration in that XML file, and Spring Boot is gonna look it up, all right? Well, you might be asking, okay, but this is 2019. Do we really wanna be doing XML files? Isn't XML verbose? Well, turns out there is a shortcut. You don't have to specify huge XML configuration. You can actually do inheriting. So here's an example of logback-spring XML file, all right? So what you have here is an include, which is looking at the base.xml, which is kind of like the default out-of-the-box configuration. And then what you specify in your XML file is only the override. So in this case, I'm specifying logger name org.springframework.web for that package. I wanna set the level as debug. So this is a one line configuration and I'm inheriting everything else from this base.xml file. You can actually look up this file, which is in your dependencies and it's gonna give you a whole lot of configuration that you can use and override if you like. So this is another way in which you can configure your logging in your Spring Boot application. All right, to summarize, what did we cover today? Logging is built in with all of the starter dependencies with Spring, right, with Spring Boot. Secondly, you use the logger factory.get logger to get the logger instance. In other words, you use the SLF4J API. But what's doing the actual work is logback. By default, Spring Boot brings in logback with those starter dependencies. But this can be changed, of course. You can specify the configuration for your logging using application property values, or you can specify XML files, Spring Boot is gonna pick it up and it's going to use that configuration. So this was how to use logging in your Spring Boot application. I hope this was helpful. Please check out some of these other videos about Spring and Spring Boot. Thanks for watching.